we finished up our series through Colossians. We've been in there for 13 weeks, and we finished that up last Wednesday. All those are online. If you care to go back and listen to the whole series from start to finish, you can binge listen to them if you, if you would like. But we are going to be in the Psalms for a few weeks. I like to kind of use the Psalms as a little bit of a a little bit of a break, if we can call it that, in between books of the Bible. And so uh, we, will, we will read a few psalms over the next month or six weeks, probably, and then we will jump back into another book, Lord willing. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what it's going to be yet, but we'll, we'll dig in when the time comes. So we'll be in Psalm 62 tonight. Psalm 62. It's a short psalm, but it's a good psalm. It's a psalm of David. We will pray, and we will jump in. Father God, we come to you, and we thank you for letting us come here tonight. And God, I pray that you would give us Jesus, just as the song says, that you can have the world, dear Lord, that we give it to you, that we give it up, that we want something better than the world has to offer. And God, we know that's Jesus, and I pray that that we want them more than anything. And God, I pray that you just would be with us tonight as we read these words. Let them be a good word to us. Maybe there's something in our life we're going through. And, and well, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit, through these encouraging words of David tonight, that they might be some encouragement to us. And I just pray that you help me to preach in a way that's going to bring glory to you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we have seen, as we've gone through the first 61 Psalms over the last couple of years here and there, we have seen these superscriptions that are at the, at the top of, of, of the Scriptures. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think that some translations do not include those superscriptions. Some of them just start with verse 1. There's not a little, a little, little, little piece above that, that that states something about the psalm. I may be wrong on that, but I think that there are some translations that don't have those superscriptions. However, I think that they are significant. For one, the superscriptions are part of the manuscripts that we have. So every manuscript of Psalms that we have that are translated from, they all include these superscriptions. So it seems that, that this was part of the original Psalm whenever it was written. And so the superscription for Psalm 62 is... For the choir director, according to Jedithon, a Davidic song. So uh, we see this Jedithon here was probably someone who uh, had something to do with music and the life of David. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he's even referenced maybe in Chronicles or Kings or one of those books. But, uh, but we see these type of superscriptions before uh, several of, of the Psalms because these were things that would have been sung by the people. Perhaps this was something uh, that David might have, uh, have, have sang himself, something that music would have been put to. Now, some of the superscriptions we see are very helpful in that they show us and tell us what's going on in the midst of the psalm that we are reading. Uh, we, we just covered and talked about uh, Psalm 51, uh, I think a couple weeks ago. We, we talked about that on, on Sunday morning. And that psalm gives us a good superscription. It tells us that it's, it's written at the time that David and Bathsheba, had, he had committed to sin with Bathsheba. And so that's a good example of a psalm, of a superscription that tells you exactly what's going on when the psalm is being written. This one, we don't have the details. So we don't know exactly what was going on in David's life when he wrote this. But regardless, the words are good to us. Verse 1. I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. Now, here in these first couple of verses, we see a, we see a word, and it's going to differ in your translations. In my translation, it's the word alone. Some of your translations, you are going to see the word only. That's going to be kind of a repetitious uh, word as we go through this psalm. It is God alone. It is only God who is going to give David strength. And so he says, I am at rest in God alone. His salvation comes from God alone. He alone, that is God, is the rock of David's salvation, his stronghold. 
Now, this is important for us to remember in our life as well. We know this is true if we read the Bible, but we need to be reminded of this. Why? Because we have hard times. That's part of what makes the book of Psalms such a good book. It's because it, it has ups and downs. It, it seems to go from, you know, praising the Lord, God is good, to God, I need help. God, I have sinned. God, deliver me. God, my enemies have come after me. God, you are my rock. And then, God, I need help. And there's these ups and downs that's not so different from my life and your life. And uh, perhaps the Psalms are arranged in this way for that reason. I don't know. Uh, but, but even though there are many things in the Psalms that are very repetitive, it kind of goes through this cycle, the same cycle that you and I go through, and we need to be reminded of these truths. Now, David was up against a hard situation, up against enemies, and what did he say? I rest in God alone. God alone is my rock. He is my salvation. He says, I will not be shaken. Now, there are many things that we go through and experience in this world that, that, that can shake us, and sometimes they do shake us. But when we are shaken, we need to remember to seek God, one who is unshakable. And if we rest in God, we too will find the same strength and comfort that David has found here in this psalm. Verse 3, how long will you threaten a man? Will all of you attack as if he were a leaning wall or a tottering stone fence? They only plan to bring him down from his high position. They take pleasure in lying. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Selah. Now, we shift gears here. It's, it's kind of hard to tell that because we go from saying, from David saying, look, God, I trust in you alone. And then all of a sudden the gear shifts to some enemies that are against David, some folks that are against David. And obviously they are threatening, they are trying to attack, they are trying to destroy him or perhaps others. And he says, look, they bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. And so we don't know exactly what this situation is, but we do know that there are evil people up to some evil deeds and that's what David is speaking out against. In the midst of what David is up against, or these evil folks are up to, David says, I will trust in God alone. I will trust only in God because he will deliver me from those who are against me. He says in verse 5, Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. My salvation and glory depend on God, my strong rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before Him. God is our refuge. Now, this is very repetitive language from what David had started this psalm out with, but, but we see this type of language. What is he saying? He says, I find my rest in God. That's where we find our rest. When we are tired, when we go through the difficulties of life that wear us out, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it may be, we will find our rest in God and in God alone. And that's what David says. He is his salvation. That is, he's going to be his savior. He's going to be his deliverer against these that are coming against him. And he refers to God multiple times in this psalm as his rock. A rock is something that, that is immovable, that cannot, cannot be moved, that you can stand upon and you can, you, can, you can build a foundation upon. It can be your foundation. And David says, God, you are my rock. And then he gives some instructions there in verse 8 where he says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Now that would be you and I as well, we would, we would benefit from, from this instruction. Pour out your hearts before him. Now, perhaps we do that regularly or perhaps we do not. But maybe we need to pour out our heart to God. You may say, well, God knows everything that's on my heart. Well, he does, but he still wants to hear from us. He still wants us to pour out our, our, our worries or our struggles or our sins or our fears or the difficulties we have, God wants us to pour out our heart to him. And David gives us good instruction here. Pour out your heart before him because God is your refuge. Now, we may ask God for a lot of things. We may ask God for lots of prayer requests, as well we should. 
But there may be times that we just need to pour our heart, just open our heart out and just talk to God like we would talk to our best friend and just just say, all right, God, I'm just laying it all out. I'm not going to use no big fancy words. God, you know everything. I'm just going to be transparent. God, here's what's going on. Here's how I feel. I don't even know how to describe it, God, but I need help. And just pouring our heart out before God. That's what David tells us to do here, and that's good advice for us. Verse 9, now we, we shift gears here back to those who are, who are causing David or causing trouble uh, to others. Verse 9, men are only a vapor, exalted men an illusion. Weighed in the scales, they go up. Together they are less than a vapor. Now, this is kind of, 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 of maybe hard language to understand. It may not... It may not be obvious, at least it's not completely obvious to me, but I think what David is saying is he is, he is saying, look, these, these folks, that, that, that these men, these evil folks that think they are high and mighty, in particular exalted men, it's, it's an illusion. They're, they don't really have the might that it would appear, the might that they think they have. God's might is far better than these men. These men may think that they are big and powerful and strong, but how does David refer to them? He refers to them as but a vapor. He says if they were weighed on the scales, uh, they would go up because they are less than a vapor. Now, if you're weighing two things on a scale, whatever has the most weight is going to go down, and whatever is weightless is going to go up. And I think what David is saying about these, these evil men here is that they are essentially weight. They hold no weight. When, when, when God comes down on the scale, they are but a vapor. The scale goes up. They are, of no, they are of no competition to God. They are of no threat to God. And for those who trust in God, God will deliver them. He says in verse 10, Place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery. If wealth increases, pay no attention to it. Uh, it sounds as though this... The, these folks that David is referring to are not good people. They are oppressing others. They are robbing others. They have put their 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 hope and their wealth or in their abilities, uh, and they think that they are so good because they can oppress others and steal from them and increase their own wealth. But David says, don't pay attention to that. Don't don't pay attention to your wealth. Don't trust in your wealth. That's a good advice for you and I too, uh, because if we're not careful. We can, we can become like these that David is talking about. We can begin to think too high and mighty of ourselves as we ascend to some type of fame or power or, or wealth in this world, whatever we may get, we too may fall into this trap. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this trap. So we must be careful that we do not trust in our wealth if it should happen to increase. That was the problem with these folks, as the scripture says, uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and that is certainly true in our world today. Uh, there are many problems in our world that probably are the result of greed, people not making decisions that are for the good of those around them, but they're making decisions for the good of their pocket because their God is money. They are trusting in their wealth because with their wealth, they think comes power that will not be able to be overcome. But it doesn't matter how much wealth someone has. There's no amount of wealth in the history of the world that can overcome the power of God. And David knows that. David says, you trust in your wealth, but I'm going to trust in my rock. And we're going to see which one, which one wins at the end of the day. And we know the answer to that. God is going to be greater than those people we may come against that are out to get us or the situations that we may be up against. Verse 11. God has spoken once. I have heard this twice. Strength belongs to God. That's an interesting verse. God has spoken once. I have heard twice. I was uh, reading the commentary of, of Charles Spurgeon, and he said, uh, we often speak many words and say nothing, but yet God can speak once, and his words continue to echo. And how true that is. Uh, so, what David is saying here, God, you have spoken. I hear your word. It is, it is reverberating in my ears, in my heart, in my mind. I have heard it twice. And many of us, there's probably passages that, that, that we've read once or twice, but yet 
the power of that passage continues to come to our mind in certain situations. That scripture is recalled to us because it's a living word when we read the word of God. And David says, look, God, I have heard you speak and your word is, 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 is echoing in my mind. And he says, strength belongs to the Lord. And then he says in verse 12, and faithful love belongs to you, Lord, for you repay each according to his works. Now, when we talk about David, we're talking about a righteous man. We're not talking about a sinless man. We're talking about a man who sinned greatly on, on, on a few occasions in his life. But generally speaking, when we speak of David, he is a righteous man. He is a godly man. And even when he sinned, he repented. And so when we look at the ones that David addressed, we see folks that, that appear to be evil, folks that don't care about the Lord, that don't care about the power of the Lord, that don't care about other people, that want to oppress other people, that want to be proud in their own might, that want to trust in their own wealth. And David says, look, God will repay each according to his works. And so what do you think is going to happen to David and those who are righteous, those of us who trust the Lord? Well, guess what? We are going to be repaid in God's glory in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. But what about those who do what is evil, who, who, who deny God, who reject God, who reject God's word, who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Well, just as the righteous will be rewarded for their faith in Jesus, well, so will those who are not righteous uh, be rewarded with the punishment that they will receive when they stand before God. And so David says, look, I'm in a tough situation. There are people against me. Things are difficult, but I will not be overcome because the strength of the Lord is greater than the strength of my enemy. So he says, I rest in the Lord. I rest in God alone. I trust in God alone. He is my salvation alone. And I hope tonight God is your salvation alone. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. We thank you for your good word. And I pray that we would find strength in you, that we would trust you, dear Lord, that we would find rest in you. God, I pray that you would help us not to be overcome by our situations and those people that we may encounter that are against us because, God, we know that we are overcomers. And it may look like folks that we encounter get the best of us for a little while. But, God, we know you have the final say. And we know, God, that you will uh, bring justice when the time comes. So, God, help us to be those who walk righteously before you and help us to love those who may come against us. God, that we can show them your love, that they too would repent and walk righteously before you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.